Our next guest will be fighting Frankie Science at UFC 194, the founder of Team Alpha Male, and holds the most finishes and submissions in the UFC bantamweight division. The opposing coach from Conor McGregor on Tough 22, Uriah Faber. Welcome back to the program. How are you, man? Doing good. How are you? Very well now that you're on the program, Uriah. Now, we saw a very funny picture of what looked like Dana White in your office with the caption, after weeks of back and forth banter, I've decided to fire Dana White and take over the UFC, Lorenzo Fatita, what to do next. Just wondering, how's your rule over the UFC been so far? Give us some ideas of what you've implemented since you've taken over your, with your evil reign. <laughs> yeah, man, it's been good. You know, first <laughs> off, uh, everyone in the UFC office is wearing bathing suits. Love men it. and women. Mm -hmm. And uh, flip-flops at all times. <laughs> and, uh, you know... No suits allowed unless you're going to court. <laughs> yep. And, uh, I was going to say, we can imagine certain people may not be happy about the uh, flip-flops and, and, and bathing shorts. <laughs> yeah, they got to give it a chance. What about headbands? More headbands around the office. Yeah, we do headbands. That'll work. We were also going through your Twitter. We also saw a pic of you and Nate Diaz where you said, we need our own talk show. Nate is the 209 Oprah telling stories and dropping knowledge. This intrigued us. Tell us an example of some of these 209 Oprah stories. Oh, man, dude. Nate is just, you know, Nate and Nick have grown a lot. I've known those guys for a long time. They've just grown a lot as individuals and uh, as fighters, but, like, as people. So he was just telling me how his, self, how his interpretation of, of, of wealth when he was first on The Ultimate Fighter, he was just like, man, I didn't know anything. He's like... I had one like I can't remember if he said he won twelve or nine thousand bucks and he thought he was rich. He was gonna <laughs> buy him, his mom a house, he was gonna get himself a Cadillac and all this stuff and we just told stories the whole way, man, about like just how much he's learned, you know, when he was <laughs> he's just an introspective guy, man. I mean those guys get a, a bum rap because they haven't been the best uh you know, the best with dealing with media and dealing with authority and things like that mm -hmm. but they're, they're really intelligent guys and they're they just come from a different place so I, we we're just getting all sorts of stories some that can be told some that be, they can't and uh it was good it was good for my for my boy cody no love who uh you know is, is learning a lot and is a smart guy himself and, and kind of new in the game to, to hear some of nate's stories Mm. I mean, Nate Diaz has obviously had some issues with the UFC. How's he doing? Into, is, is he feeling good about what's happening with him now? Obviously, he's got a fight coming up. Is he excited about it? I know he's had a lot of back and forth with the company so far. Yeah, he's, he, he's, uh, I think he's in a good place. Now. I think he, 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 I think he kind of realized like he, he kind of sabotaged himself and was like, man, that didn't work out for me, and, and uh, I need to fight, I need to win, and I need, you know, he has his goals set, so... Uh, I liked hearing I liked hearing him be introspective and and see that you know turning new leaves and and just growing because he's a young guy as far as uh, experience goes in the fight game he's he's kind of an older guy but he's still a very young guy. Mm. It's good to hear because we can't wait to see him back in the octagon. Moving on to your fight, you will be a part of the huge UFC 194 card featuring your opposing coach Conor McGregor. Your headline in the prelim card. We know you've spoken about the advantages of being on the prelims before. Obviously, a lot of eyeballs, uh, the, the you know the public, the cheapskates will watch it. But did any part of you want to make it out to the main card for this one? Uh, a little bit, you know. D to be honest, so I've I've kind of built that relationship with Fox Sports One, always pumping up. That I'm going to be, uh, you know, be, being that guy. This is going to be a big card, though. So I imagine my fight will probably be on the pay per view card, anyways. Mm. Uh, unless it's a really bad fight, then I, I, I wouldn't want more people to watch it. But <laughs> um, when this happens, it usually goes as the main event on that on that Fox Sports One, and then it gets rolled over and gets put into the to the main card. So um, it's kind of a win win for me. Does a part of you feel like because they love putting you on there so much and you expressed how well you do there that in the future maybe maybe they can put you back up on the main card even though you do such a great job being on top of the prelim card? You wouldn't mind being back on the main card someday soon? Oh, I'm, I will be for sure. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to be in the main card when it, it pays me to be in the main card. You know what I mean? Because there's a big misconception about how we get – get paid in here and and i get paid exactly the same whether i'm on the 
the the Fox Sports One card or the main event card. Mm. When I'm in the main event, the main event, that that's when I'll get paid, and that's when I'd like to make a point to be there. Gotcha. Because I know we've asked you before about pay per view points, and you sort of said, "Look, it doesn't affect me either way." Maybe that was because you weren't in the main event. And I, I wasn't going to bring this up till later on in the interview, but something we were watching a video recently. You and Connor were sort of passionately discussing, I guess, business, and you know, he was talking about numbers and, and money from pay per views. And you mentioned how you only just got your, I guess, I think, pay per view points from the time you fought Aldo in WEC. I think forty eight or forty nine, and that was like five and a half years ago, which. I, I don't know whether that's just the standard, but I found it crazy. Is that sort of the standard? And are you still waiting on, on sort of, uh, I guess, pay-per-view points from, like, older fights? Well, don't exactly quote me on this, but this is my understanding of how things work, being that it's had pay-per-view before. And Connor's deal may be different. I've had quite a few conversations with Connor inside, off-camera and on-camera about, you know, different business stuff. And... The way pay-per-view works, if you get a piece of the pay-per-view and people can sign away their right to pay-per-view to uh, to take guaranteed money, most likely when you roll that dice, the UFC are very intelligent and they're probably going to get the upper hand on that. But um, for for pay-per-view, pay-per-view, it's like it's like almost like uh, Pepsi or Budweiser distribution. There's different people in different areas that have. Um, different rights to to areas. So someone has the rights to be a distribu- distributor for Pepsi in Sacramento, in New York, in the small town of Humboldt, or what, what you know, whatever whatever it is. It's individual rights to it, and it's the same way from what I understand with pay per view. So there's some big providers that 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 maintain a lot of the pay per view. So you're basically talking about guys that. Uh, that have like a big region like New York and they have, you know, they get a piece, they're the pay-per-view provider. So they take their cut, but there's also the mom and pops and little towns and little cities all across the globe or wherever they do pay-per-view that have to tally their own results and some take longer than others, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's almost like you, it's, it wasn't like I got, ju- I had just got my money from, from Jose Aldo. I had gotten one little check five years later wow meaning is accumulation you, you get you get different amount you I mean you get different amounts of money over different times because people are you know there's different businesses they're being run by different people and have different methods etc so uh, some people take forever mm. you know so uh so it's just an interesting thing and i mean people don't understand that it's like like i, I if, if you're not getting paid on a pay-per-view and like for example, Ronda's recently become a big pay per view star, but three fights ago she was doing like four hundred fifty thousand buys. Mm. You know, on a pre on a free card on the Fox Sports One card, you're getting over a million people tuning in and then a bunch of eyes that you wouldn't have got otherwise walking by the bar, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they're building her as a star as a star as a star, which she is, but is when it comes to pay per views, uh, you're gonna probably get less eyes. So um, you know, that's how I think about things. Mm. I, I, I myself am a brand. I The pay stays the same. I want more eyes on me. Mm, you like Jerry Seinfeld getting random checks from Japan for years to come. Now, <laughs> let's talk about your opponent, Frankie Sainz. He's on a seven-fight win streak. It's another case of a tough opponent, but not really someone who's known by fans. Are you happy with this matchup? Or with a massive card like this and you being on TV every week on Tough, were you hoping for a bigger name? There was some names that that uh, that I mean, I, not that much bigger. I mean, who are the biggest names in the, in my division, in your opinion? Mm. Well, well, you got, I, you got oh, Brian Caraway, you got a Sterling, maybe Thomas Almeida. Yeah, Brian, Brian Caraway didn't accept. Brian Caraway didn't accept the fight, and then uh, and then yeah. So I, I mean, here's here's the truth. That's a big understatement that he's not very well known. Like no one knows who Frankie is. Mm. He he he's he's on a what seven fight win streak, but I think his one loss before that was a disqualification for him throwing a legal knee. Mm. Guy is very very tough, and you know no one knew who T.J. Dillashaw was either. So I'm taking this guy very serious, uh, you know, and and approaching him as as a top level competitor because he is. And I'm not necessarily pumped about how much notoriety he has, but that's his problem. You know, I've got plenty for myself, and, and uh, I've 
plan on putting on a great fight and fighting tooth and nail. And, um, you know, I'm excited for the fights to come after that as well, but I got to win this one first. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, so, sorry to cut in, Casper, but you mentioned that Brian Caraway didn't take the fight. Do you, have, do you have any information on why he chose not to take that fight? Because that seems like a no-brainer for him. I don't know. I actually confronted him about it because I know Brian. He used to train with us, and I saw him in, at a in a at an event, and I was like, "Dude, we're supposed to throw down. We're going to be the main. We're actually going to be the the main event where where Chad and, and um, Frankie are mm-hmm. the day before." Right, that was that was supposed to be our fight, and then he said, "I think he said he had like a family reunion or something." So, who knows? Okay, gotcha. Going back to Frankie's science, like you mentioned, he's a veteran at 35 years old. He's won all but uh, two of his 13 fights. One of them was a DQ. He's also known for being a very persistent and relentless wrestler with uh, you know good takedowns. However, you're one of the best wrestlers and submission grapplers in the division. Do you sort of see this as your fight to lose? You've kind of got obviously the experience. You've got uh, some of the you know the most finishes in bantamweight history. Is this kind of like your fight to lose? Um. Well, I never go into anything thinking like that. I mean, uh, every fight is uh, is for me a fight that I that I feel like you know I should be winning. But that being said, he he brings a no matter what. This is the one thing I know about wrestling and the, the intensity that wrestling brings. This is going to be a very very difficult fight just because I've seen the way he tra- the way he fights and it's a wrestling grind mentality not necessarily just wrestling he throws uh, a lot of you know knees and 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 hands and kicks and things like that but the uh the pace and the mentality is the wrestling grind which i understand guys like Lance Palmer understand Chad Mendes understands Frank Yeager understands guys that have wrestled at a high level for a very long time understand so that that being said uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a high-paced fight like that, but I, I do feel like, yeah, this is my fight to lose. I'd have to blow it because I feel like I'm the better martial artist for sure. Mm, it's going to be great for the division, for the bantamweight division. Speaking of the division, uh, John Dodson, he'll be making his return to the bantamweight division soon, it looks like, trying to hunt for TJ Dillashaw's title. Just wondering, would you be interested in possibly welcoming Dodson back to the division if everything goes to plan at UFC 194? Um. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, there's a couple fights I'm really looking forward to. I wasn't one I've even thought about, uh, but sure. I, I have my, my, my eyes on, you know, there's probably three big fights for me out there that I, that I, that I, that I get excited about. And, and everything else is, uh, is sure, okay, whatever. Well, let's forget about that one then. Tell us about some of the fights that you're excited about. Because, you know, from speaking to you in the past, we know that when you've got a fight come up and you've obviously got Frankie Science, you're only focusing on that one. But... It's okay to sort of have a few sort of down the line. What are some of these other big fights that you sort of got your eye on? Well, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm back in the hunt for a belt. Uh, there's a, a friend and a foe that are about to do battle. Mm. TJ Dillashaw and, and uh, Dominic Cruz. TJ being the friend and Dominic being the foe. Mm-hmm. Uh, on top of that, <clears throat> I could see myself going back up. This is this has been a process. I, I gained weight to go go up and fight Frankie and then the weight never came down which I wasn't used to I, I was walking around like 164 uh, a little thicker than I normally would be mm-hmm. and uh, so this has been a a tough cut and I'm going to see with the, without IVs and things like that how, how the 35 pound weight class is going to do for me but I could go back up to 45 and there's super fights up there too guys like uh, Conor McGregor so I mean, those are three fights in itself Cruz, TJ, and and Connor that I think a lot of eyes would be on, and would also be fights that I could make some real money on, mm. like we talked about before. Let's just touch on that uh, potential title hunt that you're in. Is it is it a case where you'd only take that fight if Dominic Cruz beats TJ Dillashaw, or are you guys at a point now where, even though you're friends, you're willing to put that aside to fight him if he does beat Dominic Cruz? Yeah, yeah, if he's the champion, yeah. Is that is that's what you're asking? Well, because before, back in the day, um, when you were on our program, you said because he was a part of Team Alpha Male and you guys had a relationship, you weren't sure whether or not you'd fight TJ Dillashaw. Now, obviously, he's left the camp. So um, I'm just wondering if that means that you're more likely to fight him if you do get the opportunity now. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, what am I going to tell Zufa? 
<laughs> hey, you know, this guy used to be on my team, so uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight for the world championship. No, it's not gonna happen. No, uh, of course. I've, I guess it's it's been a long time since we uh, we did our interview, but yeah, mm-hmm. no doubt. I've, I know that, yeah, and, and that's the thing, like, for for a long time, there was always that thing, you, and you, I can't stress enough that you and TJ are still friends, but it was always, a, I guess, a tough thing, because on one hand, you wanted that title belt, but if TJ was holding the belt, it was like, look, we're friends, we're teammates, you know, it's it's not going to happen. Is there a sense of relief on your part, now that TJ sort of gone and done his own thing, you guys are no longer officially teammates, is it almost a relief where you don't have to feel bad that you do want that title belt, and, you know, you have no problems with fighting him now? No, it's not relief. It's it's not the best feeling to be honest. I mean, I mean, he and I aren't the best of friends like we were before, as you can imagine. Uh, I feel like he's kind of turned himself into a victim in this whole situation, where, like, in his mind, I'm the bad guy because he's left our team. And I told him, all right, well, if you're not on our team, you know, you, you can't be coming in here and and training with us, you know. So he. <laughs> He feels that I kicked him out of the gym, he said in an interview or something like that, which is, is kind of comical as, as the fact that he actually moved to different state and claimed a different team and told me that he was no longer going to be with our team. But uh, So I think that he's, he's a little shaken up about it. And, and you know what, man? This is a sport where... Uh, we are competitors. I've actually fought friends of mine, like Scotty Jorgensen mm. and uh, and Brian Bowles and Charlie Valencia. These are all guys that have been friends of mine. And and uh, you know the whole thing with with TJ was just kind of. I mean, it was. It's it's not. It's not something I'm happy about. You know, but this is this is the, this is the truth. A lot of people think that the whole TJ Dillashaw thing coincided with some of the comments that you made about Dwayne Ludwig. I'm just wondering, was there any relation between those comments and him making the move there, not being able to train with you guys anymore? Was, did that play into it at all? Um, no, no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think he actually went and joined a different team, uh, Team Elevation, and Dwayne's not the head coach there. Mm. He's uh, He's got his own gym far away. I mean, I mean, maybe, you know, what you don't want to do is have one of your, a guy that's trying to actively ruin your team uh, be closely allied with somebody who's on your team. So when he cut ties, then, of course, you play that factor into it. But, I mean, I, whatever on that, on that case, it, it is what it is. Sure. Let's go back to the Ultimate Fighter for a second, because I feel like the TJ Dillashaw thing's sort of been done for a bit. The show's almost over. Rate the experience for us compared to the tough that you did with Dominic Cruz. Which one have you enjoyed more? What are the biggest differences? It's ironic because uh, <clears throat> I actually enjoyed this one more. I had a lot more fun with it, and uh, uh, I feel like I have my work cut out with, for me a little bit. I mean, the difference last time was that that uh, we had double the time to work with these guys, and we got to pick our own team. So you got to analyze the guys, you know, look at their records, who had padded records, who had who had real competition, who had you know, were high level in other areas, and then you got to watch them fight, and then you got to pick them, and then you had three months to develop these guys. Uh, this time around, it was like uh, the the producers or the matchmakers, whoever was like, "All right, guys, here's your team, Uriah, and here's your team, Connor, <clears throat> and uh, these guys will be fighting every three days." So it was it was just a different experience altogether, and. That being said, I, I, I was uh, I was happy with my guys' mentalities. I felt like they could have been a little more experienced coming in. I know that we had seven guys from our team that tried out that didn't make the show that I thought would have done really well on the show. And, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoyed the process. It was fun having back-and-forth banter with, with McGregor because uh, McGregor, although he can, he can be irritating sometimes, has a lot of personality, and Cruz is just kind of a, a bitter dude who's a dud. And uh, so that made for for a lot more fun, and uh, you know, I, other than other than my guys not getting as many W's as I would have liked, uh, I feel like uh, it was it was a good experience all the way around. Mm. Now, you are, before we jump to the tap out round and finish off the interview, we just noticed that you recently Instagrammed a picture of the boys at Team Alpha Male wearing different types of talk gear. 
and you wrote that you missed seeing talk worn in the octagon. Just wondering, how hard has it been to make that adjustment for you from seeing talk worn by athletes such as John Jones and many other top fighters to not seeing it worn in the octagon at all? Uh, it's a bit unfortunate. You know, I mean, part of this sport is, uh, you know, the individuality. One of the things that makes it stand out is you have characters like, like Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor and myself that have our own styles and personalities and, and, and things that make us us. So as far as what goes, you know, what goes into, uh, being an individual, I, I like to see some variety. I mean, I don't dislike the Reebok stuff. I just like my stuff better. And I, and I'd, uh, you know, just miss it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's a lifestyle brand, so it's still there. But, uh, I mean, everybody looks the same right now with the outfits. Yeah, for sure. All right, you're right. We're going to wrap up the you know, variety is the spice of life. Well, you know, we've heard it, we've heard it, uh, reference to, it's almost like with NASCAR where everybody looks different, every car looks different. And now, you know, all the cars or all the fighters kind of look the same. So, you know, with, th- there's a side to each story. We're going to wrap up the interview with the submission radio tap out round. We ask you a whole bunch of fun questions. You answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready, Uriah? I am ready. When are we going to see John Jones teaching Uriah Faber how to Dougie part two? <laughs> I don't think either of us knew how to Dougie very well. No. <laughs> I, mean, I certainly don't know how, but I don't think he did either. But uh, I get down there and, and dance with the champ again, uh, Johnny Bones. Now, he's back, isn't he? He is back, yeah. And you, you mentioned him as the champion, but he doesn't have the belt. Are you saying that you still believe he is the champion? Yeah, he's the champion. Cormier is a champion also. Both those guys are champions. Mm. Uh we're going to find out who's who's the man, the man, when they fight again. But, yeah, Jones didn't do anything to to stop being the champion, in my mind, as far as fighting goes. Well, if the roles were reversed, what dance could you teach John Jones in the next video? Man, I don't have much variation in uh, <laughs> in my dance. I am a little bit older, so I might have to bring some, some old school stuff, like some Roger Rabbit or the Running Man or something like that. But I bet he knows that. Yeah, <laughs> no, nah, he probably does. It's probably good that you're teaching him because we don't know how to dance uh, for, for anything. You hung out with Craig Robinson from Hot Type Time Machine. This is the end of Pineapple Express. Tell us, is he as funny in regular life as he is in movies? Oh, man, Craig's a crack-up, dude. That guy, he's just, uh, not only is he a talented guy, but he's just a uh, uh, just a character. You know, he, he's, he's got a joke about everything. He actually came down and did stand-up in, in Sacramento, and he brought me up on stage and gave me like five minutes to 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 talk to the crowd and do some some of my own jokes. And I I uh, I probably stunk it up pretty bad, but I tried <laughs> I tried my hardest. Wow! All right. Well, we have to ask you. Can you can you give us a joke? What 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 did you do up on stage? Do you remember one of them? Can you give us a a, a bit of a taste, a little sample? I just uh, I just told some stories. I told a story about you know that actor. She had a. Uh, she just got in trouble for stabbing her boyfriend. Um, wow, what's her name? It's at Reese. Uh, uh, Reese. With a spoon? What's her name? No, with a knife. No, no, no. <laughs> Reese, <laughs> Reese with a spoon. Was that the actress? No, <laughs> you didn't get the joke. <laughs> oh, oh my god. god, I'm an idiot. Wow, but that was pretty good. That was good. We laughed, right? That was good. That was good. Reese, Reese Witherspoon, no, with a knife. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's that's tough. that's why we're not comedians. <laughs> Got your ass. Was that one of the jokes? Was that something that you told on stage? You know, I, I what I did was I I told the story about the girl breaking into my house and crapping everywhere, mm. and then I ended with that, and I said, you know, I, it's crazy that I made headlines of that when there's people like that one actress that just stabbed her her boyfriend and i was like what's her name and then and then i told that joke yeah well you know what it's better than the airplane peanuts joke that we usually lead our comedy off with now let's talk about something else that we saw we saw some crazy stuff going on at the team at the last team alpha male meeting the team meeting now we imagine it was like stone cutters in the in the simpsons would we be right uh you're talking about the alpha male meeting on my instagram Yeah. yeah Was it like the Stone Cutters? Uh, in the I don't Simpsons. Know what that is. This, I, I, we're we're not, Homer Simpson's not, part of that secret what, society. I think it's meant to be like a takeoff of the Illuminati. <laughs> you know what? We just had fun in there, man. I, I we had a serious conversation, and then I got the surround sound going in my house, and next <laughs> thing you know, uh, everybody was was having a good time, and uh, we made that funny video. 
We also saw on Instagram you've been rocking the man bun lately, Uriah. There's a lot of negativity towards man buns. Give us a couple of man bun positives. The man, see, here I'm a functional guy. Uh, that's the reason <laughs> I wear Uggs because they're warm, and I, I usually wear sandals. And when it gets cold enough, I put on Uggs. But uh, I don't really care what things look like or what people think about them. It's a pure function. So that keeps the hair out of my eyes so I don't get knocked out while I'm blinking. Mm, well, that's, that's a positive, positive. ride there. Now, t- give us quickly your thoughts on the whole Ronda Rousey versus Holly Holm fight that happened here in Melbourne, UFC 193. What were your thoughts about Ronda's performance and the overall uh, big win by Holly Holm? Man, I was pretty impressed with Holly. I, I, I know. I, I, uh, you always feel bad because Rousey is a friend. And Holm, I, I consider uh, someone that I'm, I'm a fan of also, and I've always been friendly with her. But I know Ronda on a deeper level. So seeing her get her face kicked and smashed like that was, was hard to see, mm. but Holm did an amazing job. And I think what we're seeing is, I mean, people forget how new female mixed martial arts is. It's, it's only been a couple of years. Ronda, who's the most dominant champion of all time has only had 12 fights. Um, and you're talking about two high caliber females. So you're talking about somebody that is a, kickboxing and, and boxing world champion that's been training for 20 years in one discipline, like diligently, and she's a gifted athlete, etc. cetera. And then you're seeing uh, a woman who's been a, a judo player since she was a young girl and raised by a mom that is, is super intense and, and mindful of like making her daughter a champion. There's only very few of those in existence, like very, very few. You know, some girls started wrestling in high school and things like that, but girls that have started from a very young age and have had 20 plus years of training to be combat athletes are very rare. So we got to see those two match off. I think Rousey was aggressive as she should have been. I think maybe more, a little more aggressive with the, with the takedowns rather than marching forward into stand up. But I mean, there's still a lot of growth that needs to happen in the mixed martial arts world for the females, you know? Mm-mm. You mentioned that she was aggressive. Do you think the game plan was flawed? A lot of people think that she shouldn't have tried to outbox a boxer. I mean, she doesn't necessarily trying to outbox her. I don't think she. I think she should have used a lot more footwork and head movement, one hundred and fifty percent. But I mean, how if you got a, a girl who's taller and longer and and a lot more seasoned stand up, how are you going to get close to her and take her down, especially when she's been training with one of the best camps? in the world on how to not get taken down. I mean, Rousey should have used a lot more footwork and head and head movement in my opinion, and maybe practice up on more, a little more wrestling, a little less judo. Uh, but you know, it wasn't like all she had to do is snap her fingers and take the girl down. You know, it wasn't that easy. She's dealing with Holly Holm is now the most dominant champion out there. Well, we're going to do a prediction for, obviously, your fight against Frankie Sides, but just quickly, Uriah, rematch, Ronda Rousey, Holly Holm, UFC 200. Can Ronda win the rematch? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're talking about high-level athletes. I mean, Holly, Holly can, can win also, but, you know, Rousey is, she's no stranger to defeat. I mean, 12 fights in the mixed martial arts she is, but she's been a competitor her whole life, just like, you know, all of us wrestlers and judo players and boxers and kickboxers that have done so since we are kids. She's going to make adjustments. They're going to come back and have another great fight. Of course she could win, uh, but Holly could win as well. Mm. And finally, the most important one, what is your prediction? How are you beating Frankie Science at uh, the ultra-stacked UFC 194, Uriah? I just want to finish. Whether it's a submission or a KO or a TKO, I, I just want to finish, and I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to get it, but I'll be doing everything in my power from the get-go to make it happen. Well, there you guys go. Check out your eye fighting at UFC 194, December 12th in America and the 13th here in Australia. And make sure to follow Uriah on Twitter at Uriah Faber. Also check him out on Instagram. Lots of great stuff there. Uriah, as always, a real pleasure having you on the program. Thank you so much for taking the time and popping on. You got it, guys. Great to talk to you again. 